My name is Mackenzie Bezik. I'm a senior project manager at Voluble Insights, a company that specializes in using social media and other online data in commercial litigation. As experienced litigators will know, surveys are often viewed as a gold standard for measuring consumer beliefs or behavior. In this video, I'll be discussing how social media data and survey data complement one another, and how the two data sources together can provide comprehensive, converging evidence for experts to rely on. To understand why experts often decide to rely on both types of data, let's first take a high-level look at the characteristics that make social media data unique. Social media data are generated spontaneously, unprompted by a researcher. The data are continuously being generated. Social media captures real-time conversation as events of interest are unfolding. The data serve as a historical record of the conversation surrounding past events. And finally, since humans are infinitely creative and indirect in how we express ourselves, social media data are messy and unstructured. Let's now look specifically at how social media data differ from survey data to tee up a discussion of the advantages and disadvantages of both. The first major difference is the origin of each data type. Let's look at surveys first. To generate survey data, respondents are asked a narrow set of questions in a specific order. While survey may allow for some open-ended responses, most surveys in large part rely on questions that require respondents to select from a predetermined set of answers. This is a kind of design data in that the researcher is constructing an experiment in which they solicit specific data from respondents. Here's an example of survey programming for a question administered to an online panel of respondents that fit the demographic criteria. As this example illustrates, respondents can only choose from one of four possible predetermined responses. As respondents complete the survey, their journey is tightly controlled. The survey stimuli that respondents are exposed to is carefully curated by the researcher. In contrast to survey data, we refer to social media data as found data because the researcher starts with a set of posts that were generated independently of the researcher's data collection efforts. It's spontaneous and unprompted. Users post about whatever it is they find relevant to their experience. The language used can be quite diverse, reflecting the norms of different demographics and platforms. To see how found data can be helpful, let's consider a hypothetical dispute between two suit makers. Company A, Alpha, and Company B, Beta. In May of 2022, Alpha falsely stated that Beta's soup contains MSG. In its complaint, Beta alleges that it's been harmed by Alpha's false statements. Let's first look at social media posts from Alpha itself. On the left, we see an Instagram post from Alpha containing an ad issue statement. On the right, we see a tweet from Alpha containing an ad issue statement elicited a high level of engagement, over 300 comments, 800 retweets, and 1,200 likes. We also see use of the hashtag, no MSG for me. Now let's look at some posts from consumers. In the posts on the left, we see that consumer one is parroting Alpha's hashtag, which may be evidence of a link between Alpha's ad issue statements and consumers' negative beliefs about beta. In the middle and rightmost posts, we see anecdotal evidence that Alpha's ad issue statements have affected beta sales. Found data can be probative in other ways as well. To see how, let's look at another key difference between survey and social media data. This difference relates to how each data type is analyzed. Survey data are relatively straightforward to analyze and quantify. The analysis follows a top-down approach where narrow questions allow the researcher to test a hypothesis and draw conclusions. The number of data points collected is typically small, but large enough to make statistical inferences. Returning to our dispute between alpha and beta, Here's an example of a survey conclusion that supports the hypothesis that beta has been harmed. Here we see that a significant number of respondents would be less likely to, to purchase beta soup if it contained MSG. Turning back now to social media. As found data, the analysis often follows a bottom-up approach. A bottom-up approach is a data-driven effort, wherein a researcher identifies themes and phenomena that emerge from the found data. Let's look now at an example of a bottom-up social media analysis. In this analysis, we measure the frequency of words appearing in posts about beta in the month before Alpha's ad issue statement and the month after Alpha's statement. In these word clouds, words that occur more frequently in the data set appear larger. In the before word cloud on the left, frequently occurring words include tasty, delicious, and yummy. In the after word cloud on the right, frequently occurring words include sodium, MSG, sodium nitrate, and salt. 
Comparing the before and after word clouds, we see a theme emerge from the data that we otherwise may have missed had we only relied on top-down analyses. Following Alpha's ad issue statement, consumers have begun linking beta to other unhealthy ingredients in addition to MSG, like sodium nitrate. This linkage could exacerbate the harm to beta. When analyzing found data, top-down analyses are also possible in some situations. This may involve the testing of hypotheses by looking at the volume or characteristics of the data over time. It may also be possible to identify ahead of time an a priori content of interest. Here's a top-down social media conclusion that supports the hypothesis that beta has been harmed. Here we see that the volume of posts about beta containing the word MSG increased markedly in the wake of Alpha's ad issue statement. We also see that following Alpha's statement, the volume of posts connecting MSG to beta remained elevated for months. Now that we better understand some of the differences between the nature and use cases of survey and social media data, let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of both. In the advantage column for surveys, there are well-established practices surrounding the administration of surveys in a litigation context. In some cases, surveys have to follow a very specific format, and there are clear benchmarks regarding what counts as a meaningful result. Researchers can ask the specific questions thought to be most relevant. However, there are disadvantages that can affect the usefulness of results for some research questions. Litigation surveys are often conducted after the fact. An expert may be asking respondents to recall events that occurred years ago. In such cases, responses may be influenced or biased by subsequent events or experiences, or by the fallibility of respondents' memories. In some cases, the exact timing of a change in consumers' attitudes is important. A survey conducted after the fact may not be able to provide reliable insight into that issue. The researcher may be asking respondents questions regarding an issue they'd never thought about before. Such issues might not have had an impact on respondents' perceptions or behavior at the time of interest. And finally, surveys may fail to replicate the actual consumer experience or marketplace conditions. Surveys are thus often criticized as not providing valid data regarding the question of interest. Turning back now to social media. Social media data are especially useful for cases that require the trier of fact to consider consumers' opinions associated with an event in the past. Social media data capture users' contemporaneous thoughts as events unfolded and can reveal the immediate impacts of those events. Social media data is often more voluminous. While surveys usually generate the smallest data set that can support a statistical inference, Social media data sets can include a much larger number of observations, tens or hundreds of thousands or even millions of posts. Social media data is real-world data produced by consumers as part of their everyday lives, and therefore avoids the issues related to replicating marketplace conditions. But in the disadvantage column, as a found data, it's messy. It's subject to the idiosyncrasies of different platforms. The data collected may not be directly relevant to the topic of interest, or the relevance to the topic may be surprising and unexpected. And finally, social media data is relatively new to litigation, and the standards for analysis and acceptance by the courts are evolving. At Voluble, we closely monitor these evolving standards. As we've observed, there are a variety of well-established methods of analyzing data from academia that are finding their way into litigation. Content analysis, network analysis, and event studies are good examples of rigorous academic work that's applicable to social media analysis and litigation. Looking at the advantages and disadvantages, it's clear that the differences between social media and surveys make the two great complements. The advantages of one can overcome the disadvantages of the other to provide a broad base of evidence that's together greater than the sum of its parts. The convergence of evidence from these different sources can together form powerful evidence for an expert to rely on. Our team would be pleased to do a free consultation involving a preliminary review of the landscape of consumer conversation related to your case. Contact us if you think that social media may be relevant to your case. We strongly encourage you to think of social media analysis whenever the voice of the consumer is relevant. If you're thinking about conducting a survey, think about social media analysis too.